All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar in support of the Dec Declaration on Research Assessment's 10-year anniversary, or DORA. What should impact assessment look like for social science? My name is Camille Gamboa, joining you from Sage Publishing. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping, then I'll do an intro and then we'll kick off. So this event will be recorded and sent out to all registrants. For those who um, are wondering, we will um, have a lengthy Q&A section at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar. Um, use the Q&A feature for questions so we can make sure that we see them. You are also welcome though to use the chat feature to interact with other participants. In fact, if you'd like to feel free to go in right now and introduce yourself to the group um, and um, state why you're attending today because we'd love to hear a little bit about our um, attendees and audience. And then finally for you tweeters, um, feel free to join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Dora at 10. All right, now first, just a little bit about SAGE and why we're hosting this webinar. You may not know this, but SAGE is an independent publisher, which means that we measure success, not by our share price because we don't have one, but by how we support the development of ideas through the research process to scholarship that is certified, taught, and then often applied. We are hosting this webinar because we are very passionate about helping social and behavioral science in particular to make a positive impact on the world. And so we have put considerable effort into redefining how we measure research success so that we can celebrate and incentivize research that ultimately will benefit society. As sociologist Duncan Watts says, measurement is a tremendous driver of science. I'm sure you've all witnessed this before. And yet we focus on one simple, blunt citation-based measure that doesn't adequately capture the type of success that most directly impacts it makes impact beyond academia. If we can improve how we track and measure research success, we can drive the type of science that will better the world. So SAGE, which is a proud signatory of DORA, is honoring longer term and alternative metrics, working on new technologies that will allow for the research community to more easily track their outside impact, watch this space, it's coming out in the fall, and engaging with thought leaders like our panelists in discussions on how we can do more. If you have projects, events, or ideas in this space that could use our support, I'd love to hear about them. Feel free to message us to let us know. And now without further ado, um, I'd like to bring in our speakers, Anna Harvey, Tony Michelle, and Cassidy Sujiboto. I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves and how their research assessment fits into their roles. So Anna, let's start with you. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Harvey. I'm the president of the Social Science Research Council, which is a 100 year old nonprofit headquartered in Brooklyn Heights. I'm also faculty at New York University in uh, political science, data science, and law. Um, and, you know, at the SSRC, the SSRC is a funder of research through fellowships and research grants. And so the organization is interested in research assessment. Um, because it helps us make the case to the, um, the primary funders, the research foundations and the national science agencies. Um, so we're very interested in thinking about how do we do that effectively. All right, let's go to Tony. Uh, hello, um, my name is Tony Michel, and uh, I'm here on uh, behalf of uh, SHRC, uh, which which is the Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada. Uh, we are the federal government uh, granting agency for academic research excellence in uh, social sciences and humanities. And uh, our two uh, sister granting agencies um, cover STEM research, the um, uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and uh, the Canadian Institute of Health Research. So a couple of times you may hear me refer to the tri-agencies because we coordinate our work um, very closely, but I'm very pleased to be talking with a special focus today on um, what this means for the social sciences and humanities, because I believe it impacts it quite distinctly and differently than the natural sciences. Cassie. 
Hello, delighted to be here today. I'm Kasti Sugimoto. Um, I am a professor in the School of Public Policy and also head of school at the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology. So many of my activities now are focused on impact assessment of my own faculty. So I have about 50 direct reports and I have to decide how I can calculate their success and um, analyze their own impact. Uh, prior to coming to Georgia Tech, I was at the National Science Foundation where I served as the program officer for the Science of Science and Innovation Policy Program within the social, behavioral and economic uh, sciences. So I've also thought a lot about how we incentivize reward and resource scientists through federal grant funding. So. I hope that we will be able to bring all of that to bear on today's conversation. So thanks for having us, Camille. Awesome. As you can tell, we have, we've got a fantastic panel here. Um, so I think someone had mentioned the chat was not working. Feel free to try it out now for those of you in the audience and um, hopefully you can all chat and introduce yourselves now. Um, but let me know if, if you can't through the Q&A box. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to ask our panelists, what do you mean when you talk about impact assessment? So Cassidy, let's start with you this time. Sure. So when I think about impact, right, this is a simple statement, but I think it's really important as we look at the change that someone or some entity has made on the world. So when we're looking at scientists or scholars, we think about the change that scholars or scholarly organizations have had upon science. And I mean that writ broadly in the Latin or German sense of it as knowledge creators and consumers. So what I love about DORA and this platform for conversations about impact assessment is we're thinking about how do we measure that? How do we measure the change that someone has had upon science or scholarship or the scholarly ecosystem? And that change, I think we can have a neutral value. Was that change positive or negative, right? There are many kinds of impact that we can consider in this space. So how do we measure that change? How have you changed? How have you had an impact upon science? Now, what Dora asked us to do was to think broadly about those spheres. In the original declaration, they even talk about the training of students. And that goes back to my work when I was a doctoral student. My own dissertation looked at that. How can we actually measure the success of faculty members by how many doctoral students they graduate on the efficacy of their mentoring, on the positive experience that their students have had? How can we think about training of new scientists as a form of impact? Dora also asks us to look beyond journal indicators to other article level metrics. But I think it's that broadening, it's that space of saying, what are all the ways in which a scholar through their professional experience enacts change or difference upon the world and how do we measure that? Fascinating, thank you so much. Tony, what, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, we have a, a number of different um, policy policies and incentives for researchers, including a, a very high profile prize called the Impact Prize. Um, we have prestigious Canada research chairs to retain talent. Uh, we have a number of different, you know, awards for, uh, in different categories. All of them really come down to an evaluation that's undertaken by peer review by experts. And so when we think of um, impact, um, it's the policy guidelines and framework that is our responsibility to um, introduce the correct norms really for this discussion of what the peer reviewers are thinking about when they're thinking about impact. So we have a number of um, really policy guidelines, which are, um, as Dora asks us to do, uh, make them transparent, they're online, anybody can read them, you know, when they're filling out their application. But the peer reviewers are looking for impact on a wide range of different types of outputs. Um, they're looking for impact on public policy. They're looking for um, definitely impact on students and mentorship. That is part of it. They're looking for knowledge mobilization impact, um, including what the researcher who's asking for granting public funds, um, what their strategy is for open access to their research, because if it's publicly funded, the public um, can uh, have access to it. Um, but also community impacts, especially through research partnerships with communities. So it was just a broad scope of things. We, we provide these policy documents and training for the merit review process so that it fulfills these um, public goods, these public uh, policy goals, since it's 
public funds. Great, thank you. All right, Anna. Yeah, it's such an interesting conversation already. Um, so, you know, when, when when I think about impact assessment, you know, I think about you know, the word impact is, um, and this, you know, this this kind of came up in, in the earlier comments, the word impact is, it's a causal word, right? So you look it up and what it means is to have an effect on something. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think that, um, you know, having this conversation among social behavioral scientists is a, is a really great um, thing to do because that's what we do, right? Is we think about um, uh, a causality and, and how to make those kinds of inferences. And, you know, the field of impact evaluation has really exploded over the last 10, 15 years across a number of different policy areas. And we're getting, we're getting better and better um, at, at thinking about how do we estimate these, these, the causal impacts of something in the world. So for research assessment and thinking about impact assessment in terms of research, um, you know, I think that if you think about how, to, how do you make inferences uh, of, of causality about the outputs of research, the impacts of those in the world, whether it's publications or patents or students or um, or startups, right? Like the, a variety of kinds of things that come out of research. Um, you know, it's challenging. It's challenging because you have to think about the counterfactual of, you know, these things in the world, would they have happened had it not been for, right, the paper that got produced um, or the students who were trained? Um, and so generally, you know, the people who are starting to work on this question seriously um, in, in a research context of how do we estimate the causal impacts of research, they're generally, they're not looking at individual cases, right? Um, and so it's somewhat different from, you know, the, the case that Tony is talking about where it's, you know, we're, we're trying to think about for an individual person what's impact. The, the scholarly way of thinking about impact is, is to look more broadly across say funding streams and stopping and starting of funding streams where you can estimate the impact of you know, a funding stream starting on new publications and patents and students. And then you can, you know, in the second stage, look at the impacts on um, you know, the founding of new firms or, or jobs or you know, innovations in the world beyond the, the, that first stage proximate um, research output. So, so I think for us, we're thinking about things like, um, and, and the conversations that we're having with say the, the science agencies in the United States are things like you know, CHIPS in science um, and ACTS um, provides for a number of new large funding streams and how, um, how is the NSF going to be able to report back to Congress in three years from now on the impacts of those new research investments on innovation and the translation of innovation and particularly of interest to our Congress on economic outcomes. So, so we're, we're thinking about, um, at the SSRC, we're thinking about impact assessment in terms of those, um, how do you estimate the impacts of you know, uh, in in a, in a larger sense of, um, of of research grant streams, of fellowship streams um, that, that are stopping and starting at some time. Great. Well, it sounds like in, in terms of getting on the same page, we all agree that, you know, impact means a variety of things. There are a variety of different examples. Cassidy, you were talking about broadening uh, the term impact and, and, and change. Um, and we probably all agree it's a challenge as Anna <laughs> just indicated. Um, so let's go to our next question. Um, okay, so now that we've kind of defined what we mean by impact assessment, how does it actually play out in practice? What does it look like right now, especially for the social and behavioral sciences, which is where our focus is today? And then, you know, thinking if, towards the future and where we want to get to, how should it play out in, in a better or, or an ideal uh, system? So Tony, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, sure. Thank you for that. Um, it was really interesting to hear the different responses. I, uh, and one of the things that came up in the Dora discussion we had recently, too, was that the word impact, it, you know, it's almost as though the journal impact uh, number, you, you sort of journal impact has been disconnected and it's just your impact factor, right? As opposed to the journal impact factor. And that even that journal impact factor was designed for librarians originally so they could design which journals to buy. 
And so how, how the, the language is sort of taken on a life of its own and we end up with these curiously narrow ideas of impact. So if we've broadened the scope of impact and we put it into practice, um, there's really, uh, especially in the social sciences and the humanities, um, uh, we really have a wide scope of thinking about the societal impacts um, of that um, impact. Um, in terms of um, identifying it and practices and, and um, looking at it, some of the things that we're trying to do to allow people to tell us the story in their applications and in considering you know, what is the potential for these research initiatives to have societal impact are things like a more narrative CV style, right? And so we are currently pilot testing a narrative CV that begins by asking the researcher to make their personal statement about, you know, what's driving their research, uh, what are their impacts going to be, and then in a more general sense, asks them, you know, what are your um, major contributions that you've made, right? It gives them a huge number of prompts, and this is all online that people can see as they're filling out the application, um, and says that they can include journal articles, but they can also include a wide number of other research that could be counted as contributions. And so really broadening the scope of practice for what counts as uh, you know, having a significant uh, impact. Um, in addition to asking them to sort of uh, consider all the other um, policy guidelines about how they're uh, going to have knowledge mobilization, how they're going to create useful and meaningful opportunities for graduate students to gain uh, skills and improve the capacity of the system. So, you know, contributing to, 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 to science, contributing to the research community, contributing to society, those concentric circles there. Um, but it's a, it's a practical tool that we're pilot testing right now um, that is a less rigid form for people to tell a more diverse approaches to doing their work. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. I should ask, ask the panelists if, if there's any specific product you refer to and you have time, please do put it into the link into the chat box because I think there that people would be interested to learn more. Um, all right, let's um, let's go on to Anna. Great. Well, and, and you know, just to remind everybody that we're in we're in a different context than Tony, right? So, so our job um, is instead of trying to um, uh, you know facilitate the assessment of impact at the individual level, we're trying to make a case to funders about um, uh, about research impact in such a way that it um, fully documents what I think are the um, enormous, but I don't know how enormous, <laughs> impacts of research um, on, on the world, on outcomes that we care about, um, and, and to, to estimate those outcomes and, and to provide them to funders in a way that is, is um, compelling. Um, and so operationally, you know, part of, um, Part of the part of the, the the challenge in estimating these impacts um, has been um, getting access to good data, um, and so, for instance, one of the um, ways that you can estimate impact is to, if you have not just data on individuals who who did receive, say, we're talking about a funding stream, a fellowship, or a grant, um, not just the individuals who did receive the grants, because this is often what, you know, what, what organizations, when they're reporting impact, they'll sort of compile a list of, well, here, here, are, the, here are the people who received grants, and here's, you know, their, their research outputs. Um, but really, you know, if you're thinking about impact, is is you want to think about that counterfactual of what um, what got produced as a result of the grant um, that that would not have have gotten produced without the grant, and then think about what what are those impacts? What are the impacts of the grant on on the research? And then you can think about the impacts of research on the world. One of the easiest ways to do that is to have information on applicants, right? And if there's Sort of a threshold for funding and there's a cutoff you can look at people who are close to the cutoff and you can look at their trajectories their publication trajectories their you know other research outputs their students and then you can look at those you know what what other 
follow on, whether it's economic or social impacts from, from receiving the grant. Um, you know, and that's something we're starting, you're starting to see funding agencies um, hear that case from social and behavioral scientists and, and share those data. Um, one of the other things that funding agencies can do to, um, to support that assessment um, process is to, um, to randomize. Um, and maybe they can randomize within, um, you know, have, have a combination of both reviewers ranking applications. And you might say, okay, so above some threshold, like these are clear, um, these are clear funds, funding decisions, and below some thresholds, these are clear don't fund. But then maybe there's a band, you know, within which you can you can randomize. Um, I had an interesting conversation with the British Academy last week, um, where the British Academy has um, is is piloting a, a, a fully randomized um, small grants program. Um, and so again, with randomizing, you'll be able to see kind of what happens, what kind of research and, and what further impacts there are with people who receive the grants versus the people who are randomly selected not to receive the grants. Um, and the, the other sort of data um, strategy that, that people, including the SSRC, have been piloting, and, and then I'll stop, is um, linking at the individual level detailed grant information um, and so all of us who are in university context, every time you receive a grant, um, uh, anybody who's attached to that grant, whether it's, you know, it's faculty, it's postdoc, it's graduate students, an undergraduate student, it's research staff, it's vendors, um, all of that information is, is stored in university, um, uh, you know, sponsored program databases. Um, and because universities are employers, all of those people who are attached to a grant um, are also, you know, get reported to, um, in the United States, to your state um, uh, labor department. Um, so you can actually start to link at the individual level people who are attached to research grants. And, you know, when a graduate student leaves the university, a graduate student who is attached to a research grant, they leave the university, they go out into the world, they get a job, we can see that. Um, we can see their next job, we can see their earnings. Um, so we can start to um, uh, measure um, for, you know, original funding agencies, we can start to measure the impact of a new funding stream coming in. It touches a bunch of different people, and then those people go out into the world and achieve outcomes. And if we kind of look at what outcomes were before the funding stream comes in, we can start to make inferences. Um, but that, I think, is something that we're only now starting to do. Um, and we're SSRC, we're, we're doing this in the United States, um, working with the National Science Foundation. And so that's, that's gonna start to give us even better data to be able to estimate research impact. That's really interesting. Um, and I'm not sure if you have a, a, a synopsis of that anywhere, Anna, but if you do and you can link to it, there are people asking for, for those links. So um, thank you very much. Cassidy. Sure. But to answer this, I actually want to go back to what I think Katerina asked, which I thought was a fascinating question in the chat. She said, where does your impact creation journey start? Which I think is a brilliant and interesting wording. Now, Salima answered, hey, it's about making a difference in the real world. So I do applied research, which is the good side of that. But I think that question, your creation, the impact creation journey can also have an insidious side to it. Because what you might say is, I'm going to start my research project thinking about the impact in the end, but not thinking about making the difference in the world, but what kind of impact assessment will be done on me and making sure that I meet that goal. So we, we know about all of this goal displacement stuff that happens. Now for the social and behavioral sciences, that starts with your mode of production itself. You may choose to write a journal article instead of a book because you think it's going to count more. It's going to weigh more. There are more indicators associated with it. Um, you may choose to write for certain venues because you are going up for a promotion and tenure. And so you need to have a certain journal name on your CV in order to go through that process. And even perhaps the worst case of this is you may choose to investigate certain topics because those are the only things that will get funded. And as we've seen from certain research that has massive equity implications. For example, at the National Institutes of Health in the United States, black and African-American applicants were less likely to get funding for one particular reason. The topics in which they applied were underfunded at the NIH. And we see similar results at funding agencies across the world. So when you're gearing your topics towards a sort of dominant narrative or dominant funding model, because that is the impact that counts for you, that has massive implications for what we know, for the knowledge that exists 
in the world. So those are the insidious things of starting with an impact lens when you're beginning your research. If your impact lens is couched in certain journals, certain modes of production, certain kinds of grants and the, and the assessments that go along with that. So I love that Anna gave some examples of funding agencies and others who are playing with some of these indicators. Now there are sort of, again, sort of a complex balance that has to be measured here. So there was a fantastic study in Canada that looked at when you included information on the applicants rather than just the science itself, women and underrepresented populations tended to do worse because they tended to have lower rankings on many of those indicators that we use for impact assessment. So when you're judging the scientist and not the science, um, we often skew results in certain ways. However, some agencies like Howard Hughes Medical Institutes really focuses on people, not projects. But what they mean by that is we're funding brilliant scientists and we're allowing them the freedom to explore any topic that they want so that they're not bound and constrained by the journals in which they're going to publish or the grants for which they're going to apply. So there are ways in which you can do this, but each one often has sort of a dark cloud under those ships. So you have to be very careful during any of these changes in impact assessment that when you're going in what you think is a really positive direction, you may be creating certain inequities in the system as you make those changes. And I think that's particularly the case for the social and behavioral sciences, which are so heterogeneous. There are so many different ways to do knowledge creation across the social and behavioral sciences, and in some ways much more heterogeneous than other fields and sort of large domains of study. So I think it's really important for us to kind of consider that as we try to optimize this scenario. Now, one thing that I think that we can do and Dora asks us to do is downplay the role of the journal itself, is to play more on the science. What are the actual contributions to science? So um, in my own work, I've, I've taken a cue actually from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which said, throw out journal names. Never put journal names in any of your presentations on your slides and your CVs, take them out, talk about the science. So as chair of a school, I send out a weekly update every week. Um, on what my faculty have done. And I take out all the journal names. I say, they published a paper on this topic. Here is what they found. These are the results and here's a link. Now you click on the link, you can see where it was published and you can infer anything you want, but it's downplaying all of those signals of reputation and credibility. And instead asking people to ask questions about the science. Does this look like credible science? Is that a good question to have asked? Not did they score a cell Lancet nature or science paper, but wow, they investigated this really interesting question. And I think it's reforming the narrative in those very simple ways that changes what impact looks like. And I think can reframe people's impact creation journey where they can start by saying, to what audiences am I trying, what audiences am I trying to reach? What am I trying to change? What is that effect I'm trying to have on the world? Rather than saying, I'm gonna start this project with the goal of placing it in this publication or getting a grant from this organization. Such great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love uh, Tony said we 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 have currently a curiously narrow idea of impact. I think that's true. Cassidy said, um, and yet starting with an impact net lens that is narrow is insidious. So we really have a challenge, um, especially when it comes to inequities. But then you've already started to bring us to this next question with with some of your ideas about what practical steps we can take. Uh, loved hearing about the CV idea. Tony you might want to address that a little bit further. Um, Anna, your approach with the counterfactuals um, is really interesting in, in the direction you're all going. And then things like dropping journal names, really, really, really great stuff. So let's just take this question then head on, even though we've already started to go there. What practical steps can we take to get to the more perfect system, whether immediately practical or just aspirational in the future? Let's, let's expand that a little bit more. Anna, let's start with you this time. Yeah, well, it it probably will will surprise nobody that um, you know since we're the we're the social science research council that you know I think we need more um, more we need we need funders to fund more research on how do we um, evaluate uh, research impacts um, because ideally I think what I would like to see is I'd like to see better better estimates you know from from large data sets that we, we could then understand how to you know interpret um, individual research outputs the different the different contributions and, and their importance i mean cassidy mentioned at the beginning um, you know the importance of training students one of the things that has um, 
come out of some of the more recent um, literature that kind of looks at these um, funding streams sort of stopping and starting um, for, for universities and then looks, you know, in, in, in areas adjacent to universities, whether that's a zip code or a county, right, so people are just a, a, a radius, um, what's happening in terms of um, jobs and founding of new firms and wages. Um, that uh, and then and then trying to trace the, the particular cause. What are the pathways through which those those economic impacts are happening around a university? Is that it turns out students are a really important vector for for those for those effects. So you know we um, we maybe focused on on the PI um, who's got a big research grant and you know whether the you know the the publications and maybe the patents. But, you know, the PI is stuck <laughs> at the university and probably isn't going to leave the university. It's the students who, you know, are, are research adjacent, you know, are, are, are in the orbit of the grant and who are learning things who then leave, who are, you know, these and have, have um, knowledge inside their heads that isn't fully um, uh, communicated in the publication or the patent, right? So this really valuable research training that's being, you know, pushed out into the community. And it turns out that those, it's the, it's the movement. Um, you can, you can see when, when students join, you know, join firms, um, join organizations, um, and then what happens in the organizations, that's, 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 a, it's a really important impact of, of research. And so, I think we're we're just starting to be able to put together the data and the estimations estimation strategies to be able to do that rigorously, and I would like to see more support for it from from both philanthropic and public funding. Um, I think I think that the passage of these recent um, large science investments in the United States, inflation reduction and chips and science, for example, you know those those statutory um, uh, the statutory language in those bills is very clear about, um, about the research investments are intended to produce inclusive and equitable economic growth in regions of the country that are currently underserved. Um, and so now, you know, the National Science Foundation is tasked with, you know, showing Congress that in fact, these R&D investments are, are producing that. And in fact, in, in a way, operating as an economic development agency, which is not, <laughs> which is not necessarily the NSF strong suit. So I think we're starting to, and maybe it's that our elected representatives are starting to um, ask for in a more pointed way, you know, what, what are the, the beneficial societal and economic effects from research? And that's, that's, I think, hopefully will spur more investment in kind of the social and behavioral science R&D that I think is necessary to get us to the point where we're able to say something with confidence about those impacts. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Cassidy. Yeah, I'll sort of maybe build upon what Anna said. So, you know, in the United States, the Chips and Science Act has been, I think, a game changer in terms of one of the most expansive um, mandates for improving equity and working on scientific workforce development that we have seen, um, certainly in our generation, but in, in a long time and, and perhaps ever. So I think there are a lot of things there focusing on how we are training a highly skilled labor force that doesn't necessarily go into academe. And I think a lot of the impact assessment we've done as scholarship has been very narrowly focused on um, self-perpetuation rather than considering that maybe if nine out of 10 PhDs go outside of academe, that's not bad. That actually fuels economic growth and innovation in really important ways. So I think we're starting to shift that narrative. So it is not seen as a failure when people drop out of the academic pipeline, but we rather see how it can elevate all sectors of the economy when we have trained scientists operating and functioning in these different spaces. And again, by scientists, I include social and behavioral scientists as well. So I think that's really important. However, I'm still worried that within the scholarly ecosystem and particularly the academic ecosystem within that, that change is not occurring as rapidly as I'd like to see. So Katerina asked, are there generational differences? And certainly I think the current generation is very well versed on responsible indicators. They've spent the last 10 years hearing about all of these things, but the academic job market is more competitive than it has ever been before. And so the pressures and burdens that we're placing on students going in to get these academic jobs is reinforcing um, and 
reifying these indicators as a way to filter through some of these applicants. So I think that there is still an incredible pressure where those who are able to walk away from journal impact factors and write manifestos and sign mandates tend to be those in positions of privilege, those who are already tenured in senior positions at very elite well-resourced institutions. So there's still many in the scientific system who because of their vulnerability are still very much tied to these quantitative indicators that we've constructed, including the journal impact factor. Now, I do think that, again, there's a lot of movement towards open science. And we talked about Chips and Science Act, the Office of Science and Technology Policy also pushed through an open science mandate asking that the federal agencies make things openly available. And we're starting to see changes in indicators that are what I would call indicators for social good. So what proportion of your output is in open access is a question we're asking for individuals and scientific organizations. What is the gender composition of your output uh, for organizations? And we're moving towards altmetrics and SDGs as um, labels on scientific publications. My concern is that none of those have really replaced the old room, but rather they have been additive. And I think that additive nature sometimes can come at an increased burden for new generations where they're being asked not only to now publish and meet all of the other indicators of the previous generation, but also hit certain SDG targets, have certain altmetric output, make sure that they're big on Twitter um, so that they can get a job. So I, I worry that by adding rather than replacing, we are doing a disservice to this next generation. So maybe I'll stop there and, and we can do more in the Q&A. Perfect, yeah, very interesting, great point. Um, let's go to Tony. Well, uh, really great points from my um, panelists, co-panelists there. Um, one thing that perhaps I've been remiss at not stating enough here too, is that um, as the only non-American on the panel, I, I really want to highlight too how distinct and different these things are, um, even though we're very close to the United States geographically, um, you know, for countries around the world, uh, these issues are very different and they're not playing out the same way. Uh, and so uh, the, the role that we have as a federal granting agency um, operates in an ecosystem in the humanities and social sciences where the journals people need to get published in are not the same journals that Americans are necessarily going to be published in. If I'm a historian, actually a journal is not even a goal. It's publishing a monograph, publishing a book. And a lot of these impact indexes don't even look at um, uh, books like this. So it's, I might even say that DORA is not, you know, to the extent that it sometimes gets oversimplified as minimizing the role of the journal impact uh, index or factor, um, wasn't really the biggest of our problems, right? It's it's more the idea of an ever expanding, um, a more uh, a richer understanding of how do we identify impactful um, research that brings um, a multiple levels of, of benefit, right? And um, Dora speaks to part of that, but not to all of that. So next steps going forward, um, include these development of more uh, inclusive tools um, and uh, constantly sort of refining uh, our, our ways of, of assessing that. But it also involves, like for us in Canada, some practical supports to help our Canadian journals, for example, move into um, an open access environment. Um, they, many of them will receive support from SHRC, um, and SHRC is at the same time helping um, uh, to create online um, portals and, and online uh, repositories for the publicly funded research to aid in the discoverability of, of Canadian researchers' work uh, internationally, right? Um, um, but it's not as though Canadian historians, for example, to stay with that would, would be looking to publish in the largest journal out there that has the biggest impact because they have different interests in, in the editorial policy, of them, right? So open access is, is definitely um, a, a really big part of this uh, in terms of uh, considering multiple ways of having impact. <clears throat> And then ongoing um, training. I, I was really encouraged to see at this conference I'm currently at today of uh, 
research administrators from across Canada. All of the uh, EDI sessions were just jam-packed because people are trying to help uh, the culture shift. <laughs> and this is what it really is, that there are culture shifts underway in universities of researchers who've been doing things for a very long time. And they're helping them understand that to win the grants, to get the awards, um, you know, they, they, ha they haven't really considered certain uh, dimensions, right? And this is not um, to, you know, as Cassidy said, lay on more and more requirements and things, but rather a, a bit of a shift and a reorientation. But I guess I'm also happy to say that um, in some disciplines and in some parts of the world, um, the fixation on certain indexes or numbers wasn't as big a problem to start with, right? But that doesn't change the fact that we need to, to think creatively about the changing environment for measuring research impact. Great, you bring up a fantastic point. Um, and we have a quite a, uh, when it comes to our, the people who registered and are attending our, our webinar today, we've got people from all over the world. And so I would love to hear from any of you what, how, what the differences look like where you are. Um, feel free to put in some, some thoughts in the chat box or email me directly. I'll put my email in there. Um, we also have a blog I'll put a plug in for um, called Social Science Space where we do we ask for um, paid um, blog articles about these kinds of things. So if you're interested in writing about what it looks like in your part of the world, I think that would be really interesting and fantastic. So um, great. Um, so we only, I would like to just, if we can just go through the next question um, and maybe in your your uh, your top lines um, uh, from each panelist, to go, so we can go through it um, more briefly. That way, we can get on to the questions from the audience. But I did want to get to this last next, last question um, because it kind of wraps up our um, the idea of of Dora and its anniversary. Just how your perspectives have have changed over the last decade, and then um, how you what sort of perspectives need to change in the next de decade. Um, before before we go there, though, Tony, there have been a couple requests for your link to the application form you mentioned. Um, and the, I think it was in response to the first question. So if you could put that into the chat box, it's um, um, people are asking in for it so they can see um, the types of questions that you ask applicants um, regarding impact. Do you, know do you know what I'll do? I lost my connection and I've logged back in on my phone, so I can't okay. do that. I will. Uh, I'll put it on a, a tweet somewhere. And so if, if you tweet something about the event and, you know. I'll, or they can reach out to you too, yep. if you if you want to put your contact info in there. Okay, great. Happy to do that. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Um, so this question, going back to the question, um, let's start with Cassidy. That's a, it's a hard question. And it's one that's difficult to extract the, the personal um, journey from just a more reflection on the last 10 years professionally. Um, I think when I, I come into this, I think about, um, in some ways, the death of the meritocracy. I think as a young student going into the field, it was, I'm going to work really, really hard. And then the people who work the hardest will do the best. And the people who are most brilliant will receive the resources. And science will be a fair and equitable system where things are distributed properly. And good ideas will come to the top. And everyone will have a chance to read them. And over the ten, last 10 years, I think chipping away at the idea of the meritocracy and where it's broken, um, who gets to do science, how that science is communicated, how that science is resourced, how it's consumed, how barriers, geopolitical barriers, language barriers, socioeconomic um, identity groups that create different um, filter bubbles on what you know and what you consume has I think shown me that we need to rethink the scholarly ecosystem in dramatic ways um, to reframe against that assumption that everything is meritocratic and fair organically, um, but rather we have to create structures that um, allow us to do that in better ways. The journal impact factor is one of those. It's a poor indicator mathematically, it's a poor indicator sociologically, it makes no sense and needs to be removed. But there are many other ways in which we conduct science and train students, the narratives that we tell, um, the way that we do higher education, which I think we need to dramatically rethink over the next 10 years to make sure that we are making the most efficient, the most equitable, the most robust scientific system that we can, not just from the perspective of social justice, which 
which I often speak on, but to make science better, to make science more effective, more innovative, to accelerate scientific development, we need to really take a moment to examine this and not use a notion of meritocracy as a simple shorthand to avoid making changes to the system. That's what I said. Yes, I love that fantastic point. Well said, uh, Tony. Okay, I'll give you um, maybe a couple of headlines here. There's just generally been a, a bit of a shift from our, our position as a federal agency to um, instead of just assuming that there would always be money for research for research sake, of, of really developing a more robust story about the, um, the public benefits um, of knowledge advancement and specifically what social sciences and humanities can contribute, you know, to the well-being of society, right? So that public story is, is more important over the past decade. Um, over the past decade, along with that is a knowledge mobilization sort of um, frame of mind and um, something that people probably couldn't have seen as much 10 years ago was the speed with which we seem to be moving towards uh, open access to research. Um, that, that's definitely something that we, we want to make sure that it's equitable and sustainable, um, as opposed to just sort of throwing everything open right now, because there's a lot of unforeseen uh, outcomes, especially, you know, the disappearance of certain journals and, and, and things like that, right? Um, um, a, something that has been of growing concern is language. Uh, we're a bilingual country. Um, the language of science and publication is English uh, internationally more and more. And this is again something that people perhaps outside of England and the UK, um, you know, maybe don't, you know, are more sensitive to. So I wanted to raise that point as well. Um, uh, for us, some of the two, the, the two top sort of changes have been a notion of inclusive excellence. Um, where in terms of pragmatics, if people are being excluded from participating actively, the brightest minds in our education system, it's a loss for everybody. So that's something that on a variety of different, you know, strategies we're working on. But really the biggest one, I think, in terms of a shift in Canadian society, and this is where every society has its own difference, but for us, it has to do with uh, Indigenous research. Um, and since 2015, especially, um, our position of understanding that Indigenous peoples are rights holders and understanding their self-determination has completely reoriented um, uh, research um, from in research about Indigenous peoples to uh, uh, research with Indigenous peoples and research led by Indigenous peoples. And we have um the permanent advisory committees and circles uh, for this we have uh guidelines uh for indigenous research that all of our researchers have to follow so uh those are some of the big things that have shifted and dora is a as sort of a certain aspect of this but it all comes down to understanding what impact means i think Oh, that's great. It's it's um, heartening to hear of some of these shifts, the directions that we need to go. Anna. Yeah, I'd say the thing that um, we are um, both most cognizant of and also um, most interested in pushing forward is working with university leadership um, in the United States, although actually um, also in Canada, we um, the SSRC has a, um, a research consortium of research institutions, and we've just started um, admitting members from, from Canadian research institutions. But working working with university leaderships to think about universities as embedded in these ecosystems um, that um, that include um, regional economies, regional societies, um, regional educational systems. Um, and to think about the role that, that universities can play in, in those ecosystems. Um, you know, I think that we, 
you know, we've talked a little bit about the kind of the blinkered way that we, um, you know, I think maybe it was Cassidy who mentioned it, the blinkered way that we have of thinking about ourselves as academics and of assessing our impact. And, you know, I, I completely distanced myself from all of these evaluation metrics of individual. I mean, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad I'm, I'm not in a position because I, I, I think I agree with Cassidy that, that, you know, none of them, none of them are um, really getting at what we want to get at. But in our role, working with, with university leaderships, just to really start rethinking, I think, the, the role of universities as, as contributing to the public good and the ways in which we can contribute to the public good in, in a broad sense. And I guess our hope is that by, by, by pursuing that project, that, that, change, that mindset will trickle down into things like promotion and tenure and evaluation processes. Um, and, and just in terms of the, the the um, the way that we're doing that part of it part of it is um, uh, you know working with universities and state workforce agencies state um, uh, agencies of higher education to begin talking to each other and and building data infrastructures in which they're integrating their data and they're working with each other to think about um, you know what? What skills are being hired? Are we training? Are we are we educating students um, in in a way in, in which they're able to get hired? Are are we in the universities producing knowledge and innovation that is changing um, our, our local economics landscapes and in what ways? Um, so I think it's it's about. Um, you know, and that's that's going to be a long project, both in terms of integrating all the different data sources and the cultural change that I think um, that needs to happen in universities in terms of, of taking that broader view of, of the role in universities and society. Great points. Uh, uh, in terms of the ecosystem, if anybody has has um, thoughts or ideas selfishly about, about the publisher's role, we at SAGE would love to hear your thoughts, although we're exploring it our, on our own as well. Um, your thoughts about um, working with the university leadership, very interesting, goes back to Tony's point earlier about um, um, narrative CVs or annotated CVs um, as well. Um, okay, let's go to um, the questions from the audience now. Um, and I, I have a feeling we're not even gonna get close to getting to all the, fan, the fantastic questions that we will receive because we have so many and the chat has been fantastic as well. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go there um, with, with one question from Katarina that was really interesting and, and that's to, the a, to AI. Um, do you have any insights into how re how can researchers how do you have any insights how on how researchers can use AI and emerging technologies for faster and more effective impact creation? Maybe not just researchers, but any part of the ecosystem. How do we see AI making improvements to the system? And I'll, if anyone wants to take any volunteers to take that 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 uh, question first, Anna, you unmuted first. Well, um, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I so I admit. Um, well, it's not it's not quite what you're asking. Um, uh, AI is in fact the the very first use case um, that the um, that the National Science Foundation is interested in in terms of thinking about um, how their investments in AI over the last ten years have um, what what impacts have those investment had. So it's not it's not it's not answering your question about um, how can AI help us. Do a better job, but it is it, it is it's in the same um, it's in the same realm in the sense that uh, they, I guess I guess my answer is we don't know, um, and we we certainly need more um, more R and D and more research in terms of thinking about how um, how those investments are changing our, our local ecosystems and, and impacting the world in both in both potentially both positive and negative ways. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll throw in something on that because I think it's an important thing about celebrating the 10th anniversary of DORA, right, is that this conversation actually started in many ways with groups talking about beyond the PDF of saying we had this certain technology, we had scholarly publishing that was able to produce scholarship that looked a certain way. And then when we went online, we didn't take advantage or leverage all of the amazing opportunities that this online modality provided, right? So we just basically took a print text and we put it online. I think AI is the next shift and moment in that of saying, are we taking advantage of all the current technologies in order to create 
disseminate and consume scholarly knowledge. And I think that there are tremendous opportunities. Now, there are dangers as well, but I think there are opportunities. We already do this a bit in the way we assign reviewers, given the volume and velocity of submissions that we have right now. We use AI to filter, to assign things to reviewers, to scour uh, reviewers. For impact assessment, we're starting to do more um, content analysis um, algorithmically of text themselves in order to say, are they meaningfully citing that work or is it just a peripheral citation? So we're starting to dig into the scientific text themselves to understand the meaning of citations, which are a fundamental building block of most of our impact indicators. Um, and I think that there's interesting things on language translation. I know a lot of scholars right now who are for whom English is not their first language, who put their work up into ChatGPT and use ChatGPT to effectively do more grammatical editing. So there are tools like that that we don't think of, but can actually help us to accelerate um, scholarly dissemination. So I'm really excited to leverage these tools in order to make uh, scholarship more effective. Absolutely. Um, Tony, did you want to address that one? Any uh, thoughts to add? Uh, no, I, I think... I think I'll probably pass. I, there's there's always the allure uh, of of a new tool being uh, there to help us with what is perhaps it depends on what level we're looking at, and it, I'd hate to make generalizations even about what AI is. There's different different types of tools. I mean, you could look at the algorithmic uh, things that Dora was warning us against in terms of indexes. Um, and you can find there are different uh, various algorithmic sort of measurements of, of of impact that that we're finding you know can't even that are inconsistent with each other. So I don't even I don't think we're we're quite there yet. So it's inconclusive. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, there was a direct question for Anna on, on um, they want they want to link to the reports and materials produced from the assessment work you're doing at NSF on impact indicators. If you can add that to the chat box. Yeah, we we don't have any. We're in the middle of it. We don't have any reports, but certainly as okay. soon as we have something, we'll we're, we'll be excited to share. Watch this space. Great. Um, then there was a, a interesting question from Lauren. Could there also be ways to view the engagement of PhDs? without thinking about a binary, binary model of academia or industry, perhaps thinking of it from a complex systems perspective, we were kind of going that direction before, in which PhDs can both, it can impact both of these areas and more. Who wants to chime in on that one? I'll just briefly answer yes. So we talked a little bit about that of not thinking of a sort of single pathway when we're doing doctoral education. Um, but I also think that there are a lot of models we can draw from. So in the United States, several institutions have relationships with um, FFRDCs, federally funded research and development centers um, that often are government funded entities with partnerships with universities where doctoral students are actually doing their research in that environment. I think we could extend that model to think about more partnerships and we do have some, but more partnerships partnerships with industry, more partnerships with nonprofits, so that during the course of their doctoral education, students are already deeply embedded in these other sectors and can both bring the insights from that sector into higher education, which I think is very much needed, and also take their expertise and their training to those sectors. So I think more um, bilateral exchange of knowledge um, is what we need to see as we move forward in the sort of next 10 years. Great point. Tony or anyone? Um, Tony, yeah. Yeah, we, we have a program um, called MITACS, M-I-T-A-C-S, that does just that and, and tries to align um, uh, graduate students um, with private sector um, uh, opportunities that, you know, are aligned and is sort of a mutual funding and it's a increasingly considered a, a, a sort of a prestigious um, win for the students who, who get a my tax scholarship as well, too. Any further thoughts, Anna? Okay. Well, this has been fantastic. It looks like we are just out of time. Um, but um, if um, you have any um, questions or, or thoughts, feel free to reach out to us further and we'll see what we can address because I know that there were plenty here. Some of you in the audience, just judging by your chat and interactions could have been panelists. So, so this was really great. Thank you for engaging with us. Um, we will send you the link to the recording and also a follow-up survey to get your feedback afterwards. 
And um, yeah, that, that's it. Thank you so much to our panelists and all of our participants. Have a great day.